I'm going to take you back into a story we've been looking at all weekend long. Gail and I have been married March 17th in just a few weeks, 50 years. And uh, we were just kids when we got married. And uh, we've just journeyed along together. And it's, it's been a lot of, uh, like uh, Hayden said, same with Abraham and Sarah. There have been a lot of days when we were like, yeah, this is what it's all about. And other days, like, how can I get out of this? Um, there have been... Uh, the highs and the lows, there's been the ups and the downs, there have been the wins and the losses all along the way. I, I wish you could have been here this weekend. I uh, was just thinking about something Gail experienced on our flight out here. She was sitting next to an individual, and, and you know how it is when you're in a flight, you don't know the people next to you, and you don't really talk until the very last minutes when you're be- about ready to de- de- plane. And the conversation started uh, between uh, Gail and this particular individual and said, so why are you coming to Vegas? And Gail said, we're getting ready to go there to do a a Married Life conference. And I'm sure she was not expecting that. You're going to Vegas for what? Uh, I've heard that Vegas is where marriages go to die. I didn't realize it was a place (laughs) where you would have a married, uh, Married Life conference. And then she began in a very amazing, kind of vulnerable moment, said to Gail, said, you know what? I sure wish I would have had that years ago, or my, my marriage might have lasted. And said, uh, I imagine myself in this state and time to be w- with the man that I married for all of my life, sitting on a front porch and a rocker and just enjoying our life together. And it just didn't turn out that way. I so wish I could have had what you're about to do. And I know this weekend when the couples came, they came and invested time. And we were honored that they would give up a Friday night and a Saturday morning and bring their kids and invest time. But it says something about uh, why churches like the walk exist. Because there are so many people out there that if they had an opportunity, they would love some do-overs. They would, they would love some mulligans. They would love some opportunities to go back and say, I want to rewind the tape and rewrite the script of my life. And that's why we're going to drop down into this story of Abraham and Sarah. Because this journey with God is going to ask you to go places in married life as well as all of life to go places you don't want to go. In fact, what I'm going to describe this morning, you're going to say, no way, never going to happen, not going there, not going on that part of the journey. Just not going to do it. Now, there are times when I'm invited into situations where I just can't wait to get there this kind of weekend. The other times when I'm invited into situations, I'm thinking of a thousand reasons why I don't want to go and looking for any kind of option, hoping that I might get a fever, hoping that somehow or another I could find an excuse to exit. I just don't want to go, but I know I have to. I know I've got to step into that situation. I know I've got to go through that moment. I I can't ignore it. There's, There's no detours. I can't get off the exit ramp. And so this morning, we're going to drop down into Abraham and Sarah's life. And as we do, we're going to see them, and especially Abraham, take a journey that he really doesn't want to take. And it's going to be a journey that as he begins to walk in a way that it's unimaginable, we want, and hopefully, you'll find yourself in this story somewhere along the way. And I'm going to ask you to go to a place you don't want to go and take a journey with me. Okay? okay? Sounds exciting, doesn't it? Yeah. Thank you. I want to go where I don't want to go. That's what you're asking us to do. Yeah, you bet. I want to pray, and then we'll just jump right into this. Father, um, what, a, what an experience this morning. And, and when I say experience, I know, Father, I'm talking about something more than just an emotional moment. I'm talking about something that moved my soul. Even as we were praying together, even as we were worshiping, looking at those on this stage, that Father, we're not on stage. They were up here in worship and they drew us into it. They called our attention to who you are. And so we praise you and thank you for what you've already given us today. The gift of being together, sitting in a room like this community and just having been poured into already. So now, Father, in this moment, in this uh, uh, moment in which we listen in and drop down into the story again, may we hear your voice. May it not just be listening, may it be a responding to you in all that you long to do in us. In Jesus' name, amen. 
So I'm going to invite you, if you would, you'll follow along on the screen. And we're, we're dropping into this story of Abraham and Sarah. And I don't know how much you know about their life. I only have a moment to give kind of a recap. When they are, were somewhere in that range of 65 and 75, both of them had this encounter with God that said, I want you to go to a place that I will show you. And we, even over the weekend, we defined married life as going without knowing. It means stepping in by faith and saying, okay, I'm being called into this relationship. I'm being called into this marriage and I'm going to go even though I really don't know what it's all going to be. But God said, wrap your life around my promise and purpose for your life. I'll show you, I'll make you, I'll bless you. And so they did that. And they begin this journey, and part of the big promise was uh, Abraham and Sarah didn't have any children and said, We're, I'm going to bless you with a son, and that son will be the beginning of a blessing that will bless all peoples, all nations, for all times. And so they began the journey, and there were ups and downs. They did stupid things. They did things where they took things into their own hands. They almost messed up. It would seem like God's plan and purpose for their lives. There was unbelief. There was disappointment. There were a lot of ups and downs. And then, as God had promised, when they were beyond the years of having children, Abraham's 100, Sarah is 90. You get the picture, right? (laughs) And at that particular time and place, God said, all right, here's the promise. And they had a child, and his name was... Isaac, which meant laughter. And that child now has become the the absolute laughter of their lives. What they thought was never possible. God's promise is being fulfilled. They're living it out. And Isaac is about 14 years of age when we drop down into this story in Genesis chapter 22. So let's begin reading it. There's just one phrase. I'm going to pause here for just a second. It said, sometime later, God tested Abraham. Sometime later, after all of this journey, all of the ups and downs, after leaving everything that he'd ever known, his security, his future, his inheritance, trekking down a thousand miles to a land that he had never been in, that was already occupied, that God said, I'm going to give you this land. And that's exactly what happened. It says, after all of these things, this this journey, sometime later, God tested Abraham. Now, you immediately, you probably have a little bit of flinch. God did what? He tested Abraham. The word test carries with the the meaning of extreme. This is not some like uh, get through. This is an extreme moment in his life. It's difficult. It's demanding. It came at a point in time where Abraham probably thought, All these years, I've been up and down and finally got to the point. God promised, I'm enjoying life. This is great. And now, at this moment, when life just seems to be in a great place, God comes and says, I have a test for you. It's It's a demanding moment. And I want you to trust me in this moment in a way that you've never trusted me. Here's here's just a simple statement. It will frame everything that follows. God always measures the trust of those he loves. He always measures it. Not so much that he can see how much you love him as much as you can identify how much you love him. To help you understand where that level of devotion is. Help you to see how well you know and trust me. And it's not designed so much for you to fail as much as it's designed for you to discover. So Genesis 22, let's go back into the story. You with me still? All right, here we go. He said to Abraham, and here's what he's going to ask him. Abraham calls out his name. They've had this ongoing relationship now for probably almost 60 years. And at this particular moment, and Abraham is like, all right, God's fulfilled his promise. I'm enjoying life. The laughter is there. We've been up and down, but boy, we're in a great place. And God calls out his name. And what does Abraham say? And we're going to come back to this in a little bit. He says, here I am, he replied. Then God said, and I don't think he ever imagined what God then said. Take your son. It's very deliberate here, very detailed. Take your son, take your only son, 
whom you love, Isaac, okay? And I want you to go to the region of Moriah. And the word Mount Moriah means the God who sees. And I want you to sacrifice him there. As a burnt offering on a mountain, I will show you. Now, there's no way you can sanitize this. There's no way that you can say, yeah, okay. No, the response has got to be, what kind of a God would ever ask a father to take the life of his child? There's been another story in all of Scripture that is more unsettling than this one. This is so disruptive. It's riveting. It's infuriating. It's startling. This depicts God as a divine child abuser. This depicts God as a monster God. Why would God ever ask a, a father to do this? Especially somebody that he called my friend. Why would he ever ask him to do this? It's given skeptics over the years like uh, Christopher Hitchens and Richard Dawkins to just totally dismiss any ideal that there is a God. There's inescapable tension and, and horror in this moment. You just recoil. I, I don't know about you, and I know some of you say, well, I know how the story ends. Just imagine that you don't know how the story ends. You recoil at the thought of this. And notice the deliberately, your, your son that is attached to your future and the blessing and promise and plan I said for your life, your son, your only son. Now, he had another son, Ishmael, in a different way with a different woman. So we're not talking about that. We're talking about the only son of promise, your only son, whom you love. And that's the first time the word love is mentioned in the Bible. Whom you love. Do you see, do you feel the emotion of it? You feel the request? Take Isaac, the very laughter of your life. I want you to take him, go to Mount Moriah, and I want you to offer him as a sacrifice. Now, we'll pause here for just a second. He's not, the, the tone of the language here, he's, it's not like he's making a harsh demand as much as he's reaching out with a tender plea. This is what I want you to do. I know it's going to be hard, but I want you to do it anyway. The big question you have to ask right here, you have to pause. God's going to ask the same of you. At some point, whether it be in your married life, whether it be with a child, whether it be in your profession. And the question is this, would I really trust God when the very thing he's asking me to do makes no sense, doesn't add up, it's insane. If God were to come to me and say, I want you to take whatever you're counting on, that is your Isaac, that which you would identify, which is the laughter of your life, the joy of your heart, the satisfaction, the pleasure, the fulfillment. I want you to take that, whatever it is, an accomplishment, a relationship, a financial re position, a children, a, a career. I want you to take the blessing that I've given you, the health, the family, the strength, the source of joy, whatever you hold on to tightly, with your fence clenched and say, this is not, I would never give this up. I want you to give it up for me. <laughs> Corey Tim Boom used to say this. She said, you need to hold everything loosely because it hurts when God has to pry your fingers loose. So let me ask you this. Can you let go of what you love the most because you love God more and believe that God is more than enough? Can you give up what you love because there's something you love more? That's the definition of sacrifice. So let's spend the rest of our time, now that we're all unsettled, 
Now that we're all concerned about what's that going to look like for me. And you're saying, can we just kind of move to something else? No, let's do this. My big question for you is that we're going to answer together is how did Abraham get up that mountain? How did he get there? And we're going to see how he did it. Okay, so let's drop down. You remember how Abraham responded when the Lord called out his name? He said, here I am. Now that language simply means, and I I love this, it speaks volumes to me about where my own uh, disposition is. Here I am. Do you know what Abraham was saying? Yes. Yes. Even before I know what you're going to ask me. The answer is always yes. Always yes. Don't know what you're going to say. It's yes. The key thing about Abraham, how he got up that mountain, it began with maintaining a yes predisposition toward God. The question is never whether I am or if I will. God, I don't know, but I just want you to know the answer will always, 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 always be yes. That's what he was saying. The answer is yes. Is yes. Wouldn't that be cool if that was in your married life? Just a little bit aside. Your wife says something to you and you go, yes. Yes. Husband asks you and you go, yes. It's always yes. I didn't even thought about that until just this moment. That is a great marriage principle. The answer is always yes. But that was his predisposition. The answer is yes, God. Yes. Now let's go a little bit further. When you hear Abraham respond, here I am. What had Abraham learned over this journey of faith and all the ups and downs? He had learned. And I want you, this is so important. And this is where sometimes we, we, we stop in our journey in walking by faith and trusting God for going without knowing in the uncertainty. Abraham, over the years, developed the habit of listening to the voice of God. He developed that habit. That was a rhythm in his life. And you will never hear God's voice unless you first take the time to listen. He rearranged his entire life in response to that voice. Abraham had come to trust that voice. That voice had shaped his life. I know there are times when I'm in conversation with Gail and I'm there and she'll say, always politely, you're not listening to me, are you? (laughs) You didn't hear a word I said. Years ago, I had a friend in our church in Louisville, he and his wife, Bob and Linda, and she had a hard time getting him to pay attention to her one night while he was reading the paper not a digital version, but a real paper. And she went over and set the paper on fire and got his attention. I know something here. and Listen to me for a minute. This is something I've just been thinking about a lot this year. I love this book. I love the words in it. I love to study it. There is, and Gail and I have talked about this, there is no part of my day hardly that I enjoy more than that time alone. Not from the standpoint of I got to check the box, but I am going to be able to hear God speak. It's great to read and study it, but if you don't read with the idea, I'm not going to say I read and studied my Bible, but I'm opening it up to say, God, I want to hear your voice. I want to hear what you have to say. That was the disposition of Abraham. God, I'm, I'm ready. I want to hear your voice. I, I, before I make a move, God, I want to hear your voice. Do you realize that when you go up into the course of a new day, you don't know what that day is going to be like. But if somewhere along the way you've spent time, God, I want to hear your voice. What God is doing is he's putting messages into your life, shaping you so that as you move into life that you don't know anything about, God has already prepared you so that when you get into that, you've heard his voice so you can say yes with confidence. 
That's the beauty of it. He developed the habit of listening to the voice of God. Let's go now back into the text. Genesis 22, verse 3 and 4. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. The scripture gives us very little in terms of detail about what's going through Abraham's mind. Can you imagine? This is a three-day journey over and over again. Every kind of imaginable doubt, fear settling into his mind. But what I want you to focus on is this. What does it say? Early the next morning, he got up and he loaded his donkey and he went to the place God had showed him. Early the next morning. Early the next morning. I don't know about you. My tendency in that moment would have been to have delayed as long as I could. Put off. Come up with excuses. Pulled others' opinion. Hey, by the way, this is what God's telling me to do. What do you think about it? Hoping there'd be at least one person to tell me, that's crazy. God would never tell you to do that. (laughs) But without delay... Here's the next way Abraham got up the mountain. He responded silently and obediently without delay. Okay. Didn't talk a lot about it. Didn't delay. Didn't put it off. Didn't rationalize. Didn't excuse. He responded silently, immediately, and obediently without delay. Elizabeth Elliot has spoken into so many lives over time, but I want you, and I very rarely read this long of a paragraph, but this one merits being read. So follow along on the screen. Here's what she writes. Can we give up all for the love of God? When the surrender of ourselves seems too much to ask, it is first because our thoughts about God himself are paltry. We've not really seen him. We've hardly tested him at all and learned how good he is. In our blindness, we approach him with suspicious reserve. We ask how much of our fun he intends to spoil, how much he will demand from us, how high is the price we must pay before he is placated. If we had the least notion of his loving kindness and his tender mercy, his fatherly care for his poor children, his generosity, his beautiful plans for us, If we knew how patiently he waits for our turning to him, how gently he means to lead us to green pastures and still waters, how carefully he is preparing a place for us, how ceaselessly he is ordering, ordaining, and engineering his master plan for our goodwill. If we had any inkling of all this, could we be reluctant to let go of our smashed dandelions or whatever we clutch so fiercely in our sweaty little palms? If with courage and joy we pour ourselves out for him and others for his sake, it is not possible to lose in any final sense anything worth keeping. We will lose ourselves and our selfishness. We will gain everything worth having. Back to the text. He said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. Notice this. We will worship. And then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac. And he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father. Uh, father, yes, my son Abraham replied, the fire and the wood are here. Isaac said, but where's the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. I don't know. As I'm reading through this, you've got to imagine, is, is Abraham just faking it? Hey, son, it's all right. It's all good. We're going to get there. We're going to be fine. Is he just faking it? Or is maybe, maybe deep down in his heart, Does he believe that God is up to something? This has got to be a tender emotional scene. There's no way we can imagine all that's going on between the two of them. It's unbearable. 
But here's the final way he got up the mountain. Yes, predisposition, learned to listen and trust the voice. Responded immediately, obediently, without delay, fully. Finally, he focused on his attention on God's purpose and promise and power. This was no leap of blind faith. His response was rooted in proven faith, what he had seen. Didn't, take, didn't God take that which was dead, Sarah's womb, and allow her to conceive, uh, conceive a son? Both he and Sarah's bodies were dead as far as having children was concerned. Didn't God make what was dead alive? Abraham has a good reason to believe. One way or another, God is going to keep his promise. Amen. In Hebrews chapter 11, it says this about Abraham in verse 17 through 19. By faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had embraced the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son, even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Abraham, watch this, reason that God could even raise the dead, and in such a manner of speaking, he did, receiving Isaac back from the dead. Verse 9. When they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there, and he arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac, laid him on the altar on, no, on the top of the wood, and he reached out his hand and took the knife to slain. There's no sense of struggle here on Isaac's part. I don't know exactly why, but I can speculate. Somewhere along the way, Isaac had learned from his father how to trust God. Wow. Wow. That's good. Wow. Somewhere along the way. Hey, dads, moms, your kids' faith has to become their own. But you can be a starter. You can show them. You can show them. He's ready to make the downward plunge with a knife to destroy with a single act the very love of his life. But you have to linger. Verse 11. But the angel of the Lord called him out from Abraham, Abraham, and one more time. Here I am. Yes. <laughs> yes. Wow. Do not lay a hand on the boy. Do not, do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld you with me from with me your son, your only son. I'm sure it's a moment of relief, but I think it is also a reaffirmation of his hope. And that Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. The Lord will provide. Jehovah Jireh. The ultimate expression of genuine trust is tenacious obedience fueled by an unwavering confidence in God's provision. God's provision. There are mountains in front of you. There's mountains in front of me. Those moments will come to a place called surrender when it demands the kind of sacrifice you've never thought you'd be asked to make. But watch this. Another father, another son, went up another mountain. On that day, there was no ram caught in the thicket as there was in this story that they ultimately sacrificed. On that day, that son carried not just a cross, but carried the full weight of your sin in mine. And on that cross, body broken, blood shed, what God said to us, you can trust me. You can trust me with your life you can trust me with the love of your life because I will fulfill my promise. And that's always on the other side of surrender. Always. You won't discover that until you've said yes. Until you've listened to the voice. Until you've gone up that mountain. The cross of Jesus cries out, I am enough. Amen. Trust me. Good, good. I am enough. Trust me. Amen. Question as we leave. Where are you on the journey? Have you come to the place where you've said yes? Are you at a place where you're willing to let go what you love so much? And I don't know what that is for something you love more because you trust God. He's enough. 
You placed your life in his hands, his plans, his purpose, his promise. Let's pray. On the cross, what you've done, it was more than enough, more than enough. Thank you for breaking the bread of your body. Thank you for spilling the wine of your blood. Thank you. All my heart says, thank you for breaking the bread of your body, for spilling the wine of your blood. Thank you. Thank you. You are enough. Father, in this moment, hearts that only you can see, going without knowing, trusting, yes, stepping out in faith, waiting, trusting, resting, God, you're enough. God, you're enough. Your your plans are far greater than mine. God, I trust you. I will go. I will offer. I'm yours. I'm yours. Eager willingness to engage, to walk into, to experience all that you have promised. God, I trust you. You're not taking something from me as much as you're taking that which will keep me from experiencing your so much more. It's yes. It's yes. Father, may you move in our hearts quietly, powerfully, personally. Father, help us not to say no. Help us to say yes. Here I am. In your name, Lord Jesus, sweet, wonderful Savior. Amen.